Using the process data objects in CanOpen allows us to take multiple object dictionary entries from a node and pack them all into one message. So multiple data objects can be transferred. It is a multicast, meaning anyone who wants to receive it can configure itself to, to receive the data so it can simultaneously go to different receivers. And there are a multiple of transmit triggers available. So besides the application, there can also be an automatic time-driven, synchronous, event-driven or other trigger or a combination of any of these. In this section, we are reviewing the different transmit triggers available for transmit process data objects. The event time trigger is the easiest to explain. It simply uses a fixed time that is configurable and a multiple of milliseconds to implement a time-driven mode. That means the PDO triggered is transmitted every X milliseconds, no matter what. So this makes the bandwidth very predictable. You know exactly when which traffic is generated. However, for all trigger modes, we also have a sign of caution. Here, the sign is that data is always transmitted, no matter if it changes or not, so it might waste some bandwidth, and the timers of different nodes are not synchronized. So if you are looking into uh, a 50 millisecond interval that uh, nodes repeat over and over again their message, you never know if all these 10 messages come at the same time or if there's a certain variation in between the timers running apart over time. I'm now using CanOpenMagic to have a look at the PDO communication parameters of a node. We have here a simulated node number three running. So there's a node simulation and it's a generic I.O. device. It's currently in pre-operational state. I also have here an overview of the PDO communication parameters of this node number three. So currently we have two transmit PDOs with the default IDs 183 and 283 in hex and we use event time 100 and 250 milliseconds. So let's just say node number three go into operational. Now if we go back down here in the trace window we see that the two PDOs are coming at roughly 100 and 250 milliseconds just about the time we have up here. The event-driven trigger uses COS detection, so change of state detection. If an input value changes, then it gets transmitted. So here we only transmit data as it changes. However, if data is not changed in a long time, it will not be transmitted. To avoid frequent repetition of messages, there's an inhibit time. So if data changes continuously all the time, then we introduce the inhibit time to delay transmission. Looking at our sign of caution, we have to point out that if data doesn't change a lot, messages will be on the bus very seldom. This means on the receiving side, if I miss a message for any reason, because I booted up late, I came to the group here later, then it might take a long time until I see this data again. And as a general note, it's much harder to make reliable predictions in regards to the real-time behavior of such systems. So how long will it really take until all the data is transmitted um, is much harder to predict in such a setup. Here I would like to give you an example on how the inhibit time really works. Let's assume we have here PDO 181, which is triggered by a change of state and that it has no inhibit time and the data changes a lot. So it's transmitted quite frequently. The lower priority PDOs 283 and 185 do not have a chance to get in between here because 181 is transmitted all the time.
On the bus, this scenario would result in the messages 185 and 283 barely getting a chance to get transmitted. They would fit into the little slots remaining in between the 181 messages where they are not sent back to back. Introducing an inhibit time of one milliseconds already gives us a completely different picture. Here we can see 181 was transmitted, then the inhibit time started, so no further transmission of 181. That gives the message 283 a chance to get on the bus. Even the 185 will still get on the bus because its uh, arbitration phase is the beginning right before the inhibit time. Uh, elapsed and only after message 185 was completely on the bus will 181 be transmitted again. Let's now have a look at the change of state and the inhibit time. So if I go back to my simulation here then in visual I have some switches here and with these I can change the digital input data here so if I flip those, you can see now it's a three and a zero again. So I can produce a change of state here. Currently the message still comes out at 100 milliseconds. So let's now disable the event time. So we'll put this down to zero. And for the inhibit time, um, let's start because this is manual switching here with a uh, hundred milliseconds. So that would be 1000 because it's in 100 microseconds. So enabling this, let's clear the trace to get a first start here. So currently the message is not here at all. If I go into the simulator and I now switch the bits, then with every switch, there's a message coming. So this was five seconds here to so with every switch now, if I switch really fast well, back and forth, I can see it goes down da here maybe to a hundred something milliseconds. So if I go back into the PDO configuration and now increase this to, let's say 5,000, ensure it's enabled again. Now back to my switches and clear the trace again. Now, if I try to do this as fast as possible, I will not be able to do it faster than 500 milliseconds. So it's about 500 milliseconds here. The nice thing is you can combine these values also together with an event time. So let's say if I put in here um, 1000, then what do we have? Then every second the data is transmitted because uh, we have an event time of one second. So even if I don't change the data, it will be transmitted once per second. If I change the data, then it will be transmitted faster, but never faster than 500 milliseconds. So look in the transmission times down here. Now it's around one second. And if I now flip the switches a lot, it goes out faster, but never faster than 500 milliseconds. The synchronized trigger mode uses one global sync message to tell all the nodes listening to the sync that now is the time to transmit your data or to apply the output data. So really this is a method to synchronize the inputs and outputs of multiple devices on the network. Our sign of caution here is that each sync message causes a burst of messages going onto the bus. So really there'll be a high bus load with every sync and the complexity level can get quite high because we could have potentially multiple sync messages, each involving a sync counter, and depending on counter values, triggers can react or not. Using the sync mode, we can build systems that behave as if the data would be transmitted in parallel. Let's see how this works. So we have multiple sensors that continuously collect data. With the receive of the sync signal, 
they copy the data to the transmit buffers and start transmitting. So the data in the transmit buffers is all from the same moment in time. The data is now transmitted serially over the bus, so one by one, and the data processing unit can collect all the data until it has the data from all sensors. But the nice thing for the data processing unit now is that the data it received all comes from the moment in time when the last sync was received. So it's synchronized data and this can be uh, down to far less than a millisecond in can open systems. Similar for the output, we can ensure that data transmitted to actuators really is activated in parallel. So the data processing unit uh, controller calculated the new data to be applied. It transmits it serially via the network and the, all the actuators receive the data in their receive buffers, but they do not yet apply it, they wait. Only with the receipt of the next sync signal are they actually applying the data to their outputs. Thus, again, the output is paralyzed with the sync message. They all in parallel apply their data. And now for the sync feature. So how does that work? Well, we first need a sync message. So I'll simply go to view can messages and we'll add a sync message here. So simply say, I'll do a sync message, sync, use the regular one without a counter, so length zero, and for a time trigger, let's do a 333 millisecond. So here's our 333 millisecond sync message. And now let's just make sure we have everything here set to zero. Oops, zero. And we start with the 183 message, say synchronous one, meaning on every sync. So if we start that, we'll see that with each sync, we also get uh, the PDO, 333. And if we do this in a sequence, then let's stop this after a while. We see that with every sync, just immediate after the sync, there's the PDO coming. Now, guess what happens if I put in here a sync, let's say three. Well, then this PDO comes on every third sync. So. If we hold this, then we see sync one message, the 183, 183, and here's the 283. Going backwards, yep, well, maybe it's better to see if I just do the fixed sequence again, because then we'll see that the second PDO comes all 999 or roughly one second. So this is how the sync feature is used for the transmit PDOs. In this following section, we'll now examine the object dictionary entries required to control this. The object dictionary entries controlling the trigger behavior are called the PDO communication parameters. And there are a set of transmit PDO parameters and a set of receive PDO parameters. Theoretically, every node could have up to 512 of these. Realistically, simple sensors, output devices just have one to four of these PDOs. Only the major control unit that needs to receive and transmit a lot of data will really have uh, as many PDOs as up to 512. The parameters for the communication settings are put together into a data record so that we have various sub-indexes and uh, these include at sub-index 1 the COP ID, so that's the CAN ID used. Also here's a bit for enabling, disabling the PDO. Then we have a transmit trigger type 
and uh, the times we mentioned earlier, the inhibit time and the event time are at subindex three and five. And the last value available is at subindex six, a sync counter start value. I would now like to show you these object dictionary entries in a real EDS electronic data sheet. So I'm using the can open architect editor here, a CIA 401 EDS file that is for generic IO. Then we have in the communication profile area, somewhere down here, the receive PDO communication parameters and the transmit PDO communication parameters. So 18 100 and 1801 for the first and the second. If I go in here, we can see the detailed parameters, the COP ID, which is the, the CAN ID, and somewhere down here, the inhibit time, here a default of 100, an event time default of 100 also, and the connection object ID is a combination of the ID, here's the 180 base address, plus the node ID is added, and there are a few function bits up here to disable certain functions. Reviewing the different can open and can open FD communication methods, we can say that the difference between a can open PDO and a can open FD PDO are primarily the size. So um, a can open FD variant of a PDO can have up to 64 bytes, whereas a can open PDO is limited to 8 bytes. Other than that, PDOs are always multicast, so the devices producing them just fire them off and it's up to the receivers to decide if they want to receive those or not. So that's a multicast, a one-to-n relation. And in regards to the triggering, PDOs can not only be triggered by the application, there can also be various automated triggers, change of state, time, sync, and sync with a counter. The can open SDO is a confirmed one-to-one -one communication method. It can do segmentation when needed, limited to four bytes of data when doing an expedited, so a single request and response. And the biggest limitation here is that really the channels available and can open are limited. So per default, there's only one SDO client for all nodes. So only one device can be um, a manager that communicates to all others. With some extra effort there, we can work around this issue, but the default is that it's only one. And last, the can open FD universal SDO brings everything together. It offers one-to-one -one as one-to-many communication and the client can also be done by any node. So here truly every can open node in the system can issue SDOs or universal SDOs to every other node in the system, allowing to implement a very powerful communication exchange method here.